Karen. The New Testament reading comes from Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 through 13. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is a covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the greatest of them to the, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm sort of dating myself here, but any of you remember the TV sitcom Taxi? A few nods, yes. <laughs> The actress Mary Lou Henner was one of the characters that was on that show. And she has a condition which is called hyperthymasia, which is highly superior autobi autobiographical memory, or for short, thankfully, HSAM. This is a brain condition so rare that there's only about 100 people in the world that have been diagnosed with this condition. Now, most of us, if we're lucky, can remember eight to 11 days in any particular year. People with HSAM remember all 365 days of their lives. In an interview, Henner said, whenever she sees somebody she hasn't seen for a long time, she can recall all the details of their last meeting together, where they were, what they ate. Um, she can recall any day of her life. Now, this memory is only for herself. That's the A, it's autobiographical, A in the H-A-S-A-M. Now, that, mem that kind of memory might be a blessing or it might be a curse. It might feel like you've got an ongoing video playing in your head of your whole life if you can recall everything you've ever done. But Henner finds it a blessing. Most of us are not blessed with a memory anything close to that. Our memories are generally fickle. Sometimes we can remember things clearly, perhaps a wedding or a special event. But there are times I can't remember where my keys are, where my purse is. I'm thinking I'm not the only one that happens to. But as time passes, the memory of a particular event fades and it can become replaced by generalities based on other similar events we've attended. So sometimes was that Susie's wedding or George's wedding? can't remember, the event gets kind of muddled up and confused. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's been at a family gathering and telling a family story only to find out that each person at the table has a different recollection of that story. It might want make you wonder if you were even at the same place at the same time. But we all know that our memory isn't always reliable. Memory pulled from long-term storage into short-term memory is flexible. New things can be added, and sometimes we change what we think we remember about past events, resulting in inaccuracies and distortions in those memories or recollections. How do we remember short-term things, smaller details in our lives, like learning the alphabet? Sometimes we use mnemonic devices to help us. You know, these things like rhymes or rules or phrases or diagrams or acronyms to help us remember. I'm pretty sure that most everybody in this room learned the alphabet by singing the alphabet song. Yeah, there's part of the alphabet. I have to sing the song to get the order right. <laughs> and generations of music students has used that 
every good boy does fine to remember the notes on the treble clip in which order they go in. I had a cousin who had two boys. They were stair steps just a year or so apart and I had the worst time keeping straight their names until I realized their names were the same order as the gospels, Matthew, Mark. When I remembered that, that was my little mnemonic to help keep straight which was Matthew and which was Mark. So these kind of little devices help us in a shorthand way, kind of recall all kinds of information. Deuteronomy is a book about remembering. The whole Bible, in fact, is a book about remembering. But 16 times in Deuteronomy, the word remember or remembrance appears. And in the NIV version of the Bible, it appears 167 times. Moses knew from experience that our human memory wasn't always dependable. After all, he'd been hanging out with these folks for 40 years. Moses knew that remembering takes intention and effort. He knew that our memory is subject to error. And sometimes we remember and transmit information from generation to generation because it's part of our ritual or tradition, but we may not ask why we do what we do. There was a favorite family recipe for Thanksgiving ham. It had been passed down through the generations in this family. And the mother was making the ham for Thanksgiving and she was teaching her newly married daughter to make this family special dish. The mother carefully cut both ends off the ham. She put it in the pan. She added that secret combination of spices and sauce. Her daughter was taking notes and she asked, mom, why do you cut the ends off the ham? Her mother answered, because that's how my mother taught me to do it. Later, the mother began to wonder, why did they cut the ends off the ham? So she asked her mother. The grandmother said, well, that's how my mom taught me to do it. And then the grandmother began wondering, why do we do that? And so she asked her elderly mother. The great grandmother replied, you don't need to cut off the ends. I always did that because my old oven was too small for a big pan. Sometimes we continue a tradition, even if it no longer serves a current purpose, but because that's just what we remember. Now, when a person recalls a particular event or episode that they've experienced, that's called episodic memory. These kinds of things are events and people and stories and rituals and celebrations, as well as the difficult times, trials and heartbreak, other times we've had difficulty in our lives. Many of the national holidays we recognize in our country, President's Day, Veterans Day, Memorial Day, Mother's or Father's Day, Grandparents Day, are designed to help us pause and to remember both people and events in our lives and in the history of our country. Moses' recollection of the Israelites' years in the wilderness is his way of reinforcing the memory. He's retelling their collective history to help the people not forget the presence of God in every part of their history. It's a warning to the people to not forget their covenant with the Lord their God, reminding them of the special relationship that they have with God. After all, has any other people heard the voice of God speaking out of fire and lived? Moses asked in Deuteronomy 4. Moses knew that people might not intend to distort facts, but it can happen as they recalled memories and combine them with new memories. Moses knew that people could begin to think it was by their own power and their own strength that they were able to prosper. And it, they could forget that it was God who brought them out of Egypt, who guided them and protected them and fed them in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses wanted to make sure that people didn't forget. And so what are they to remember? Must they remember every single event in their history, the cause, the dates, the significance of every war? Moses' words aren't to make historians out of the people of Israel. The events he wants them to remember are those watershed moments where God aids the people, where God's acts of intervention, for example, the release from Egypt, the crossing of the Red Sea, the years of protection and providence in the wilderness, these acts of God's intervention in their history. That's what Moses wants the people to remember. Even the bad times must be recalled. And so it's through that recollection of their history that the people 
know God. And so as part of remembering that and celebrating that, those become religious festivals and religious practices. Moses instructed the people that they were to love God with all of their strength and all of their heart and all of their mind. They were to teach their children the laws, lest the Torah be forgotten. Still today, the reading of the scriptures is one way that we continue to remember and share God's message from generation to generation. The scriptures help us to remember and consider what God has done and what God has promised to us. Religious rituals and prayer are all external indicators of an internalized memory. That's what Moses seems to be advocating for, sensing that making something habitual helps fix it in our personal and cultural memory. Religious festivals reinforce that memory. They guard against the sin of bias, that it is God, but not human beings, that play the prominent role in any story. Most of our rituals and festivals are repetitive, which indicates continuity with the past, the commemoration of the stories they're telling, Advent, Christmas, Easter, Good Friday. All of these types of festivals and holidays provide a cause for celebration. They call us to remember the events in our history. Now, Thanksgiving, while it's not a, quote, religious holiday, has themes of thankfulness and gratitude. It is attached to a historical time. On the Sunday before Thanksgiving, this day and every day, it is appropriate to remember how we've been blessed by God. We are reminded by Moses' words, don't forget the Lord your God when you eat. Get full, build nice houses and settle down. Don't think to yourself, my own strength and ability have produced all this prosperity for me. Remember the Lord your God. We are to remember who brought us through challenges and hardships, who gives us the skills and aptitude to make a living, to provide for ourselves and our families. We are to remember and give thanks to God. We are to remember and retell the story of God's actions, of God's protection and faithfulness. We are to show gratitude for all the blessings we have received, for all that God has done, and to keep that memory alive and not let it fade away in time. The Israelites remembered and celebrated God's actions in their festivals and in their worship. They were to remember God's covenant with them and live accordingly. Our religious observances of Advent and Christmas and Lent and Easter, our sacraments of baptism and communion are ways that we as a people embody and retell the story of scripture. And we often use symbolism to help remember and retell our stories. Next week, we begin the church season of Advent and we'll have an Advent wreath here that will be part of our worship over the weeks before Christmas and marking the four weeks of the Advent season, part of the way we remember and tell the story of Jesus' birth. And the wreath is sort of a visual mnemonic device. It's circular shape and the greenery on it reminds us of God's unending love. The candles remind us of love, hope, joy, and peace. And along with the Christ candle, remind us that Christ is indeed the light of the world. Our reading from Hebrews reminds us that the new covenant God revealed to the people was Jesus Christ. It was God's gift of grace through the life and death of Jesus Christ that has been promised to all who believe, that promise of eternal life. Paul wrote in his letter to the Ephesians, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. God's grace is not something we can earn, it's not something we deserve. God's grace is a gift written on the hearts of those who believe in their Lord Jesus Christ. It is a gift that we can share with others by telling the story of God's love embodied in Jesus Christ. It is the story contained in the Bible that we read and reread. Do we need to remember every prophet and every king and every law of the old covenant? No, because God did a new thing through Jesus Christ, giving us a new re reason to remember and be thankful. If we remember nothing else, remember this mnemonic. 
grace, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Remember grace and give thanks with grateful hearts today and always for God's loving care and providence. Thanks be to our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Let us stand together for our hymn of response. It is 551, not as printed in the bullet, 551. Come, you thankful people, come. Let us join in our litany of thanksgiving as printed in your bulletin. Give thanks to the Lord for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known God's deeds among the peoples. God blesses us with gifts of love, with food and clothing, home and family. God blesses us with daily work and all we need from day to day. God protects us in time of danger and guards us from every evil. God calls us into relationship with him and forms us into one holy people, the church of Jesus Christ in this place. Therefore, we shall offer thanks and praise to the Lord our God. Lord our God, we will give thanks to you forever. Amen. Please be seated. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord, listen to your children praying. You have shown us what it is to be rich in countless ways, in the beauty of the world around us, in the faces of those we love. 
We give thanks for your enduring love for each of us. We give thanks that Jesus Christ laid down his life for each one of us, that by faith and trust in Christ, we might be granted salvation. Oh God, hear our prayers of thanksgiving for our families, for our homes, for the skills and gifts that provide a living or have provided for our leisure. Forgive us, Lord, for often failing to acknowledge how privileged and blessed we are. Give us hearts of humility and gratitude, for you are ever faithful. When we gather in celebration with family and friends this week, may we remember not only the blessings of the place we live, but also those many blessings God has granted us throughout our lives, through people and experiences. You know us, oh God. You know our tendency to forget to say thank you, to take credit when we've been blessed by your grace. Write on each of our hearts and our minds your story of love and grace that we might not forget what you have done for us through Jesus Christ. Gracious God, I give you thanks for your word, the Bible, for the stories and teachings contained there, reminding us and teaching each generation of your unbounded love and relentless grace. Healer God, hear our prayers for members and friends of this congregation. We pray for Misty and for Marty, and for Milton, for Bev and Diane, for Tom and Joseph and Eric and Glenn. Almighty God, you know the needs of each one. May your love be a balm. Surround them and uplift them with your Holy Spirit. And oh God, you know each of our own hurts, our physical and emotional wounds. May your spirit guide and direct us. And God, you know the prayers of our hearts for those on our minds this day, even if we have not voiced their names aloud. We pray that those absent from our fellowship today might feel our prayers surrounding and encouraging them. We pray also, Almighty God, for those for whom Thanksgiving and other holidays are not days of celebration and joy with family, but difficult days overshadowed by difficult memories. Lord, even in difficult times, we pray that your children might feel the embrace of your spirit. We pray for those who grieve this day, especially the Hammer and Mofield families. Almighty God, give them your peace. We know, O oh God, that you are a fortress in times of trouble and that you help us to stand. May you do so for those who grieve. May all those who mourn this day find comfort through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And loving God, I give thanks for this faith community, for their ministry in this place, for all that they have shared with this community, for the Thanksgiving baskets that will bless others. We pray that you will continue to work through us until our work has been completed. We lift up the concerns of our hearts for this congregation, for our community, for our country. We pray, Almighty God, for wisdom and for peace. We pray, God, to help us listen for your voice to be your agents in this time and place. And Lord, hear our prayers not for peace only in our country, but also around the world. We pray for the leaders of our country and the world. We pray that you might grant them vision and wisdom. We pray that wounds of division might be healed. We pray for compassion and empathy for one another, that we might hear the voices of those in need and those who seek justice and peace, and that we might be agents of change and healing. And together as your children, we pray with gladness the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have much to give thanks for, not only this week, but every day. Our God is the greatest giver, giving us life and love and salvation and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So in response to God's gracious generosity, we return a portion of the blessings we receive from our labors to God's service. The offering box is on the table at the rear of the sanctuary. Let us stand together and join our voices in our doxology as printed in your bulletin. <laughs> Amen. 
Please pray with me. Ever giving God, your gifts to us are many and varied. From the breath in our bodies to the beauty of the landscape, we are surrounded by evidence of your love. In gratitude, we offer these gifts of our hands to your service and to use for your work. We pray that they will be a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is 554, not as printed in your bulletin. We had a little trouble with switching hymns at the last minute. 554, let all things now living. And now receive the benediction. May the love of God, that grace of the Son, Jesus Christ, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Alleluia. Amen. Friends, go in peace.